continuing uh, our subject, um, our study on uh, what we are, what I am, according to the Word of God, according to the Bible. We It's important to know who and what we are in the economy of God. So we're going to be talking about that uh, here this evening, uh, continuing where we left off last week. We'll wait for a few folks to come on. In the meantime, there is a a, a song that that my that my brother used to sing, my brother Arthur, and it's called "It Took a Miracle." I'm going to sing it, and and then I will sing it at the beginning of the service, and at the end of the service, I will probably attempt to sing it again depending on the time frame. It says, it took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Hello, Lena. Bob, I know you're watching tonight, Bob. I know you are. This the song I'm going to sing is a song that my brother Arthur used to love to sing back when we used to uh, be part of a youth group back in our high school days. It took a miracle. My father is omnipotent, and that you can't deny. A God of might and miracles is written in the sky. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Though, though here his glory has been shown, we still cannot fully see the wonders of his might and throne. Will take eternity. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, Cleanse and made me whole. It took a miracle of love and grace. The Bible tells us of his power and wisdom all the way through, and every little bird and flower. Our testimonies to it took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he said, my soul cleansed and made me whole. It took a miracle of love and grace. Praise the Lord. I hope you enjoyed that song. It took a miracle. It took a miracle. Praise the Lord. Well, let's open up in prayer <clears throat> and let's invite the Lord into our midst. Father God, we're so thankful that we can come into your holy presence. We thank you, Lord, for, for, Lord, for, the, for the miracle of, of love and grace. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, Father. 
We lift up the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. And Lord, we come before you tonight with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise in our mouth. We invite you into our presence, Lord, into, into our Bible study. We pray that each one of us would be anointed to, to be receptive and to receive what you have for each and every one of us. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' precious and holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. All right. <laughs> We've been going through, I am what, according to the Bible. How many, Lena and Bob, were you with, were you here in Bible study last week when we started this? this series here uh give me a thumbs up yes or let me know that if not i can start from the very beginning here um it might be a good idea just to recap anyway uh what we've already done we started with genesis chapter 1 verse 26 genesis 1 26 oh th thank you lena so we'll just do a recap here. I am what according to Genesis 126. Uh, you should have something to this effect on, on yours uh, that you're made, you were made in God's image. I am made in God's image. I am what according to Genesis 126? Made in God's image. God didn't make us to, to be like monkeys. God didn't make us to look like fish, to look like dogs or cats or horses or lizards or anything else. He made us to look like him. We're made after we, we were created after his image. As, as Genesis says, let us make man after our own kind, after our own image. And he made man and he created a woman. He, he didn't create a, a neuter gender. He didn't create, uh, uh, you know, with, with all the new uh, pronouns and everything else. He created us men and women. Created him. He created us to, to be after his own image. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, we, we we also read. And so what are you according to Deuteronomy chapter 8, 18? You are receiving power to make wealth. You're receiving power to make wealth. How, and how did that power come? The, uh, the, you know, the, uh, does it come by, by uh, does it come in our mailbox? Does it come in a box? Does it come, uh, you know, what is it coming? The power comes from God's word. All power comes from God. So Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, we are receiving power to make wealth. Now, I know that immediately, especially the these faith teachers, uh, God wants me, to, he, he's given me the power to make wealth. So I'm going to have people send all their tithes and offerings so I can buy that new Mercedes, or buy the new uh, Bentley, or buy that new jet, buy the latest of this or that, right? No, that, that's not what the Bible's talking about. He's given us the power to make wealth what he's done. He's given us mental abilities, spiritual abilities, to be able to work with our hands, to work with our minds, and to be able to make money that way. So what are you doing? Most of us just go out and get a, an 8 to 10 job. That is creating wealth. Now, by, by wealth, it doesn't mean that you're going to get rich. But you have money to buy a house. You have money to buy a car. You have money to put food on, on the table. That's wealth. So we have the power to receive we are receiving power to make wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18. In Deuteronomy 28.6, it 
what are you according to that verse and that chapter? Well, you're blessed. You're blessed coming in and you're blessed going out. You're blessed coming in and you're blessed going out. That's a blessing in itself. Just to know that you're blessed, that means that God is, has breathed life into you. He breathed Neshama into you. He, uh, he's breathed abilities into you. He's breathed uh, the power for you to make wealth. He's breathed, uh, uh, and, and God has breathed the, uh, breathed the authority into you to be able to, <clears throat> to walk among scorpions and not and not and not and not and not get bit. He's given us power and authority, hasn't he? So he's blessed us in a coming in, and he's blessed us in a going out. So no matter where we go or where we come in, as long as we are obedient to God and we're following his word, we will be blessed. We will be blessed. The fact that you got up, uh, you know, got up uh, this morning, that's a blessing. There are many people that are not waking up. And they go to bed at night and they don't wake up. They die. There's many young people today that are not going to see old age because they're dying. It's a blessing for us to be here. So we have to look at the blessings and we have to wait, you know, and we have to acknowledge those blessings. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. We read that we are what according to the Bible? We are observing and we're doing. What, what are we doing? We're following God's word. We're following God's commandments. That's what we're doing. So we are observing his word. To observe doesn't mean to, 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 uh, you know, to just look at it. To observe means that you're going to look at it and you're going to acknowledge it and you're going to abide by it. That's what observe means. A lot of people think that observe just means to look. No. To observe something, you're going to abide by that. So as long as you're abiding by God's commandments, his commands, his ordinance, his statutes, you're going to be blessed. So you continue, we want to continue observing and doing. Doing what? Following his word. Put wheels to your faith. And and because faith is an action, and if we're not acting upon our faith, what are we doing? Well, we're doubting, we're challenging, or questioning. So we need to put faith. We need to put wheels to our faith. Amen. Go to Psalms twenty three one. <clears throat> Psalms twenty three one. <clears throat> So what are we, according to Psalm 20, uh, 20, uh, 23, 1? We are what? We are his sheep, and he is what? He is our shepherd. We are his sheep, and he is our shepherd. 20, uh, 23. So many people need this verse 4. And I know that the 23rd Psalm is read mostly at funerals. <coughs> but this is applicable to all of our daily life. Verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Even though I walk not in, but through the valley of the shadow of death. I love my brother Dan. I fear no evil. What is a what is a valley? Deep darkness. Not only is it deep darkness, but it could be that you're going through financial problems. You're going through health problems. You're going through marital problems. You're going through whatever problem problems or your children or your grandchildren or whatever it is. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Through whatever darkness I'm going through, for whatever situation I'm encountering, whatever problem is happening, even though I'm walking through it, not in it, I fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Thou, God, art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, 
they comfort me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Do you believe that? Do you trust God's word to be true? I was speaking with someone earlier today, and, and, and uh, you know, because a lot of people have trust issues. You know, you either are very gullible and believe everything you hear, or you just don't trust anybody. You don't trust anything. That is applicable to Christians in their relationship with God. How do I know that? Because they try to do things on their own. They pray. They ask God. But things aren't moving fast enough. So they say, okay, Lord, I'm taking the rain here. You know what the word rain means, right? I'm taking control, Lord. I'm in control now because it's taking too long. And I need to make this house payment, this car payment, like, like yesterday. So I'm going to have to go out and do something on my own, Lord, because I don't see anything happening. Now, you, you may not verbalize that, but your thoughts certainly are. So that's a lack of trust. People say, well, it's impossible to have 100% trust. Is it really? Well, I know nobody's perfect. That's, that's obvious. But, but here's a fact for you guys. If we don't learn to start processing this word trust and start allowing it to develop and grow within our spirits, within our lives, we're never going to learn to trust God. We have to start trusting God. Most of us have to take one step at a time. But learn to trust God. So I was asked, well, don't, I mean, you're not perfect. So so are you saying that you trust God 100% of, 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 of the time? I said, you're absolutely right. I'm not perfect. But, but here's the thing. I trust God with my finances. I trust God with my children, with my grandchildren. I trust God with my, with my health. And I certainly trust God with my life. Well, say, you know, I've had guns put to me. I've had knives put to me. My life is threatened many times. I don't have any bodyguards around me like these mega pastors have. All these pastors have all these bodyguards. Where's their faith? Jesus didn't have any bodyguards. See, that's, see, that's a sad commentary. I'm not even going to address that. If you do not learn to trust God, how, how can you trust his word to be true? How could you continue in this walk of a religiosity of being called a Christian and not really, oh, but I have faith. By, by, uh, by faith, I became a Christian. By faith, I asked God to come in my heart. That's wonderful. So you trust God to come into your heart, but you're not trusting God with the rest. This is why we need to develop that trust. God is worthy to be trusted, to be trust, to trust it with. He's proven himself to us over and over again. But somehow we just don't get it. And we are our worst enemies. So we're fighting against ourselves. I want to trust, but can't. You have to start somewhere. I've learned to trust God. I have not. I don't. I don't entertain those negative thoughts that, well, God is not going to do it, or, or maybe God will do it. What I say is this, Lord, you know what my needs are. You know the situation, whatever it is. Let your will be, be done, Lord. Let your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. And when we allow God's will to be done, you're, you're beginning to put your complete trust in him. I've already tried it my way, Lord, and I, and, and, I, and I failed. I messed up. So... I give up on my, on my doing, so Lord, I give it to you. I give my children to you, my grandchildren to you, 
my my finances, the my health. A doctor don't know what to do anymore. They're giving me this medication, but you know, I read this article. You know, because the doctor says I have caught, I have high cholesterol, and and I had need to take cholesterol medicine. Well, if you look at uh, the side effects of the cholesterol medicine, uh, what is it? Sim, uh, sim, 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 uh, sim, uh, statin, sim statin. <laughs> There's so many negative side effects. One of the side effects is that it can cause you to lose your memory. It could cause Alzheimer's. So I, I just, I got to the point that I said, okay, I'm going to find out a healthy way for me to control my, to control the cholesterol because I know that there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So I have to find out what will help me to control the cholesterol level that is not creating a problem or danger to my heart. Rather than to, and, and, and looking for a natural way, rather than to take this man-made medication that has so many side effects that, you know, that could end up killing you in the end. So what I'm saying is that this is where you have to, you come to the fork in your life, left or right. This is what the doctor tells me on the left. And this is what the Lord tells me on the right. Trust me. By the way, God gave us doctors. Absolutely. But our doctors today are governed by the drug industry. The more drugs that they can give you, the more medication that they give you, the richer they get. So looking at that as a fact, so we're looking at the left, I'm looking at the right. Here's God's way, and here's man's way. How about tr attempting to trust God? Lord, I am claiming a healing in my in my body that my cholesterol becomes normal. But you have to do your part as well. You have to make sure that you're eating the right foods and not eating foods that create all this cholesterol problem. So you have to do your part too. God would God would do his part without question. So the question comes is, will you and I do our part? That's where the question comes in. So again, verse 1, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall know one. So he, I am his sheep, he is my shepherd. I am his sheep, he's my pastor. And that was in Psalms 23, 1. Psalms 37, 4. I, I, I love this. I love this a particular verse. I, I've used it a lot. But let me go to verse 3 first. Because verse 3. <laughs> verse 4 is, is not complete without verse 3. Verse 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. We were talking about trusting, aren't we? Trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. How can I trust someone that I cannot see? How can I trust someone that I cannot hear? How can I trust someone? Right? This is this is the natural human tendency. You may be a Christian and say those things. I believe God and I love God. But God wants me to handle things. But what does the Bible say? The battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. So where's your trust in that? Where's your faith in that? We need to learn to put our faith and trust in God. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. So wherever you are, wherever you are, cultivate faithfulness. How do you cultivate faithfulness? By practicing, by applying the word of God, 
by implementing, by appropriating it. And so when you start to implement it, you're actually practicing faith. And you're going to see yourself trusting the Lord more and more and more. It may not happen overnight. That's why the Bible says, unless you come as a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So people say, wait a minute. I'm, I'm beyond being a child, so I don't have a chance. No, listen to what the Spirit says. Unless you come as a child. A child will come and will put his faith and trust on whatever mom and dad say. Mom and dad could be thieves, could be killers and murderers, rapists, the worst of, of the worst of the kind. But the child doesn't know any better. They will put their faith and trust in God. Uh, I mean, and their parents. On the, on the other hand, the parents could be beautiful parents, great parents, good parents. And those parents are going to lead and guide their children to be successful in their life. Because that child trusts that mom and dad. As children of God, we need to put our faith and trust on daddy, on Abba Father, our Heavenly Father. Put our faith and trust in him. That he will do what he says he's going to do. We we you know we read a lot when we go in, go you know we go into prayer. Keep uh, just keep your hand on Psalm thirty seven four. Uh, go, uh, go go uh, go to the book of Mark real quick. Matthew Mark, Mark eleven, and I read this a lot when we go into prayer. This is where faith and trust comes in. 11.23 says, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, the word says is transliterated, means to talk to this mountain. This mountain, whatever that mountain is in your life, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. Here's the key. Do not doubt that God can perform those miracles and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what he says will, will happen, that it will, that it is going to happen. And if you believe it's going to happen, it will be granted to you because of your faith, because you trust God enough to believe that it will happen. So, so, I, so you could understand and see what what this what this faith in this trusting is all about. You have to believe in your heart. You have to have trust. Oh, but I believe, I believe, I believe what God's word says. That's wonderful. Are you trusting it? Are you completely trusting it? Are you willing to put your life on the line? See, there's a big difference by, from saying something and actually doing something. We read Deuteronomy 28.13. Remember that. And Deuteronomy 13 says we are observing and doing. We're following God's commandments. So are, are you, so are you in fact doing that? Are you in fact following God's word? Are you in fact trusting God to meet your needs, whether it's financial, whether it's health needs, whatever the needs are? Are you putting your faith and trust in God? See, this is this is where where the rubber meets the road. There you go. Go back to Psalms 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. In other words, delight yourself in the things of God. To delight means to be, to have that spirit of joy. Like Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And when you can have that joy and the delight to serve the Lord, 
He will give you the desires of your heart because he knows your heart. He knows whether you're a phony. He knows whether you're sincere. So again, 37.4, what am I according to Psalms 37.4? I'm delighting myself in Jesus. I'm delighting myself. I love doing his work. You know, not to pat myself in the back and not to make myself look holy and righteous, but I love studying God's word. I love teaching it. And I'm not getting paid for it. See, what, what pastors and Christian people don't realize as a ministry is not a vocation, folks. The ministry is not a vocation. It's a ministry. And this is what has been lost. Go to Psalms 41 now. Psalms 41.1. Over to your right. 41.1. <clears throat> How blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. How blessed is he who considers the helpless. Who are the helpless? The poor. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. What is trouble in the day of evil? So what am I according to Psalms 41, 4? I'm blessed. I am blessed. How blessed can you be? Pretty blessed. I'm blessed. You know, I, I, I was posed a very, very, very uh, complex question, you know, Say, well, this person has known me for many years, and he says, I know you're not perfect. I said, I, absolutely, absolutely. Far from being perfect. So how can you say that that you never doubt God's word, that you tr have 100% trust in him? I said, I have 100% trust to the best of my ability, to, to the best of my understanding. I, I trust the Lord with my life, with my children. I trust Him with everything, with everything. I know what it is to have, and I know what it is not to have. So everything I, I have belongs to the Lord. Because he has provided everything for me. That includes my house and everything. God has made the provisions. The Lord is my provider. Am I perfect? Far from it. Far from it. And then last week we ended with Psalms 107.2. So go to Psalms 107.2 really quick. And we ended with this. And 107.2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. Who is the adversary? The enemy. So when it says whom he has redeemed, that means past tense. It's already been done. The work has been done. We just need to acknowledge it in our own personal lives. So what am I, according to Psalm 107, 2? I am redeemed. You're redeemed from what? From the hand of the adversary. Who's the adversary? The enemy. I've been redeemed from the hand of the adversary, which is my enemy. Go to Proverbs, over to your right, chapter 3. Proverbs, chapter 3.
chapter 3, verse 6. Proverbs 3, 6. Are you guys getting anything out of this? <clears throat> I encourage you to write these scriptures down and write down what it is that you are according to those scriptures. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. Let me start with verse uh, 5 because I love, I love the... Five, six is incomplete without five again. Just like it is in Psalm 37. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. So what? What what is he what is he saying here? Don't lean on your understanding because your understanding is, well, the mortgage payment is due on the fifteenth. Today's the tenth. I don't have the money. The property taxes are due today, April tenth. I don't have the money. What am I going to do? How am I going to pay it? Do you not think that God knows that? Do you not realize that God knows that you have made the effort to get a job, to work, or whatever it was that was required for you to make those payments? He knows. But you need to learn to trust him. It may be, it may be, that you bought that car, you bought that house, knowing that you may not be able to afford to maintain the payments. But you did it anyway. You said, I did it on faith. Believe me, God was going to provide for me. See, we often try to tempt God by getting ourselves into debt, thinking that God is going to get us out of debt. That, that's not how it works, folks. We need to pray over everything. If you're going to buy a car, you need to be praying over that. If you're going to sell a car, you need to be praying over that. If you're going to buy a house, you need to be praying over that. If you're going to get married, you need to be praying over that. If you're going to get engaged, you need to be praying over that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, on your own understanding. And verse 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways. Uh, well, I acknowledge him on Sundays. I acknowledge him on Wednesdays. I acknowledge him, you know, on, on certain days. No. In all, ways, in all the time. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. And turn away from evil. So verse 6 again. And all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. So what is that saying? That means that our, when we don't acknowledge him. We have a lot of detours. Our paths is not straight. Because we're trying to make our way through life. So what are we according to Proverbs chapter 3 verse 6. I am what? I am acknowledging him in all things. So according to Proverbs 3, 6, I am, in, I am acknowledging him in all things. Who's him? Our Lord, our God, our Savior. Praise the Lord. Hello, Johnny. <clears throat> So again, we are on we are on um, going on number ten here. We're going to be going to the Song of Solomon now. Do do we all know 
who wrote the book of Proverbs? Do we know who wrote the Song of Solomon? Well, Proverbs was written by King David's son. And his name was Solomon. Who wrote Solomon? Solomon. <laughs> All right. So Song of Solomon, chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3 reads, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He who pastures his flock among the lily. He who pastures his flocks, his flock among the lilies. There, there's a song that we used to sing. I'm my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. I'm my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. I'm my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. <coughs> so I am my be I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. So what am I, according to the Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3? I am his beloved, and he is mine. I am his beloved, and he is mine. Uh, the next one is found in Isaiah, over to your right, Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah 53, verse 5, 53, 5, and we all, we, we, as a matter of fact, we read this during Easter. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was pierced. Remember what the word pierced means. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising for our well-being, the beating he took for our well-being. What is our well-being? For our peace. And it fell upon him. And by his scourging. The word scourging means stripes. And by his stripes. We are healed. In the past tense. So what am I. According to the Bible. In Isaiah 53.5. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm delivered. Praise the Lord for that. I'm healed. If you guys have any, any, uh, any, any, any uh, you know, like any comments you want to write, you know, go ahead and do so. If you have any questions, uh, what we're what we're going through, we're going through. I am what. According to to the Bible, in other words, we need to know who and what we are according to God's economy. How does God see us? How does He see us? Well, according to Isaiah fifty three five, He sees He sees us healed. We may be on crutches, but He sees us healed. So what? So what? What does that mean to us? You know, well, well, Pastor, God doesn't heal everybody. There's people that just die with their illness. Yeah, that's true. That there's people that die with cancer. They die with, you know, different illnesses. But wasn't God moved by compassion when he, when he came in the, when he came in, in, in his son, when Jesus walked on this earth, he didn't come. His mission wasn't to come to heal people or to come to, uh, and to socialize with people, he was on a mission 
to to usher in the kingdom of the Father, to there to have people have clarity and understanding that the Father loved him so much that he wanted everybody to know more about him and how they could be with him someday. So what was his mission? His mission was to was to was to redeem us. But what does the Bible say that when he walked, he was moved by compassion. And he healed all those that came to him. There was not one person that came to Jesus that was not healed. Whether they were blind, whether they were deaf, they were demon, you know, demon obsessed. Or if they had died like Lazarus, God healed and delivered because he was moved with compassion. That's the love of God. That was the love of God. <clears throat> I'm going to stop here. And next week, I'm going to start with, with the New Testament. This, you know, there's a lot that I could write things that are in the Old Testament. Uh, but there's many things that are in the New Testament. So I have around uh, maybe approximately uh, 65 to 70 that are in the New Testament. And, and, and I had 10 in the Old Testament here. So next week, we're going to be going to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. So if you, and, and Matthew 6, verse 19. So if you want to get started on, on writing it down uh, on, on, on what God is showing you, what you are according to those scriptures, take these scriptures down, Matthew 5, 13, Matthew 5, 14, and Matthew 16 and 19. Matthew 16 and 19. And we'll be going into those scriptures and I'll give you, I'll give you one more. I'll give you Mark, Mark chapter eleven, verse twenty-three and twenty-four. We read twenty-three today, by the way. So it'll be Mark eleven, twenty-three and twenty-four. Those one, two, three, four, four scriptures. We 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 will we will be starting with next Wednesday on Bible study. It's important for you and I to know what our position is. In God's economy. We need to know how God sees us. And the only way that we're going to know is to read his word. And see what he says. See what he says. We've already gone through Genesis 126. Where we're made in God's image. Deuteronomy 8.18. How God has given us the ability to receive a power. You know, he's given us the power to make wealth. Deuteronomy 28.6. God has blessed us and are coming in and are not going out. Deuteronomy 28.13. We, we are observing and doing. We're following God's commandments. To observe do, doesn't mean just to look. But to actually apply God's word. And to live according to his commands. His ordinances, his statutes, his commandments, his commands. Psalms 23, 1. We are his sheep and he, we are his sheep and he is our shepherd. Psalms 37, 4, we're delighting ourselves in the things of God. Psalms 41, 4, we're blessed. Psalms 107, 2, we have been redeemed from the hand of, our, of the adversary, which is our enemy. Proverbs 3, 6. We are acknowledging him in all things because we're putting our trust in him. In the Song of Solomon, <clears throat> he is, we are his beloved and he is ours. We are his beloved and he is ours. In Isaiah 53, 5, we are healed. We are healed. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close I, 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 you know, with these, and and um, mark here where I want to start that ne uh, next week. 
but re really quick here, and and I, I promise not, not to spend too much time on this, but uh, there are there's two things I really want to cover really quick, and that's why I wanted to cut this short today. There's two things that really would take a lot more time than just 10 minutes here. And that is <clears throat> that the church as a whole now is starting to teach two things that are heresy. And, and, uh, and this is coming because, you know, as a result of all this new teaching, uh, these new theologians, these emerging theologians and, 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 uh, a lot of a lot of biblical scholars are buying into this. So what they're doing is they're taking away from God's word, and they are superseding God's word by implanting their own opinions and their own thoughts and their own interpretation of God's word, their personal interpretation. By the way, God's word is not for anybody's personal interpretation. It's only by the Holy Spirit that God reveals what it is that He say. That's why I'm going by what I'm going for, for everybody to read these scriptures and let's see what God is showing you so that you can write it down. You don't have to go by what I have, but you can read Psalms 41 and 1, for instance. And what is God showing you there? You are what according to that scripture? What are you according to that scripture? So you let God, you, you pray on that, Lord, what am I according to the scripture? See, what I saw was that I'm blessed. But you can see other things. You can see the word blessed, you know, that you're being blessed. But you can see other things in there as well. And this is how the Lord speaks to us through his word. Let, really quick, I'm, 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 just, I'm just going off the beat here. I'm not, I'm, okay, the number one is that okay, the church has been for some time now, for the last few years, teaching that, that the Jewish people in Israel are not Jews. They're not the Jews of the Bible. I, I've actually heard this about 10 years ago, that the Jews... Of, uh, of the Bible do not exist anymore. That the church as a new, uh, 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 that's a new uh, chosen people. That the church today are God's new Jewish people. That is farther from the truth. The church, God had two covenants. He had a covenant with Abraham and he had a covenant with us. He's, and he says, a new covenant that we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But the covenant that he, that God made with Abraham, that he's to love the Lord, his God, with all his heart, all his mind, all his soul, never stopped, never ceased. And the fact that the Bible prophesied that in the last days, the Jewish people would start coming back to their nation of Canaan, if that wasn't a fact, then why are the Jewish people from every nation, from Africa, wherever the Jews were scattered, from Russia, from China, from Japan, all these people that, are, that have gone back to Israel? Because they have that yearning to go back to, the, to their country of origin. And if they're not Jews, why are so many people anti-Semitic, hate the Jews, want to wipe them out if there's no Jews anymore. See, this is a lie of the devil and people are buying it. People are buying it, folks. This is why I teach God's word. I don't teach somebody's opinion or what somebody just developed, you know, what somebody thought. I get these things all the time that there is no rapture. There's no such thing as rapture. Well, I, 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 you know, I, I have to agree that the word rapture does not appear in the Bible, but the word caught up appears in the Bible, 
and the word caught up and Thessalonian means means it means to and, 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 you know like in the Latin it means to be raptured and rapture means rapture in English well the only time Christ is coming back this is what the, you know this is what I'm being bombarded with is at the end time and the end time is the, you know is the as the second coming of Christ the first coming of Christ was when he was born the second coming of Christ is when he comes and sets foot on the Mount of Olives. So there's no rapture. The church is going to go through all this hell. Contrary to what you may read, according to all these new theologians and all these crazy thoughts, everybody's going to go through the hell. Well, I got news for you. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. And, and, I, and I encourage you guys not to argue with people like that. You love them because if they're born again believers, they have Jesus in their heart. They believe Jesus was was born uh, and born by the Holy Spirit. He went to the cross. He took our sins, our infirmities, and he rose on, on, rose on the third day. And if they believe that, they are brother and sister in the Lord. But see, there's that's why we have so many churches because everybody believes different. But if you have the basic foundational belief, that makes us brothers and sisters in the Lord. So we shouldn't be arguing. One will say, I'm a pre-trib. The other one will say, I'm a mid-trib. The other one will say, I'm a post-trib. Or I'm a no-trib. I don't believe in tribulation. That's between them and God. You just pray for them. Don't argue with them. We need to be ready. That's the bottom line. And this is why I tell everybody. Regardless whether Jesus comes tomorrow, tonight, a hundred years from now. The important thing is, are you ready? Tomorrow's not promised to anybody. There are many people that will not be waking up tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised to anybody. Today is a day of salvation. We need to have that oil in our lamp and have that light burning bright. Establish your faith on the solid rock, the rock of Jesus. He's our solid rock. Not Peter. Jesus is that rock. He's the rock of the church. And that's where the church was established, on Jesus. Not on Cephas, on the pebble, but on the rock of God. And I'm trying to think. Oh, and the, and the, and and the, and the second point. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time on this. So the second point was. I heard, this well-known pastor. That's mega church. Someone called and said, "I do not believe that God sends anybody to hell." And he said, "Oh yes." Yes, dear. God does send people to hell. When I heard that, I said, I hope I'm, I'm not hearing right. I hope I'm misunderstanding because this is one, one of the pastors that, that I thought was a you know an, an older gentleman that I thought was closer to the closer to the truth than any of the other ones I've ever heard. And when I heard him say that. I just pray. I said, Lord, I hope I heard wrong because I would I would hate to hear that this man said that yes, God sends people to hell. So I know from God's word that He doesn't send anybody to hell. We choose to go to hell. It's our choice. So I went on my on a short research. And and I come up with research from Biola College and, and, and Talbot University, and I come up, you know, from, from the Calvinist theology, uh, from the Augustinian theology, and these people believe that God sends people to hell. And they give scriptures. So I said, okay, let me look at the scriptures. Let me let me study the scriptures. Now, one scripture said that God sent people to hell. Not one of those scriptures that they used 
in their argument that God sends people to hell. Now, one of them said that not one of them indicated that God sent anybody to hell. But this is what they're teaching. So, folks, we need to be wise as serpents, as the Bible says. We need to be discerning. There's a lot of false teaching out there. There's a lot of heresy out there. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Study to show yourself approved. Don't let anybody misguide you or mislead you. This is so important. Okay, I, I, I'm not going to go in, any further than that. I, I just wanted to bring those two little things that that I was dealing with today, and and uh, I it really it really uh, it bothered me to to just to think that there's people that really believe that God sends people to hell. What happened with John three seventeen? For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Oh, wait a minute. He, he says um, he's not here to condemn the world. But yet, people are thinking, yeah, but God sends people to hell. That doesn't make any sense, does it? God said not to send to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, we are taking scripture and we're trying to make it fit our own thinking, our own opinions, our own ideas. And we can't do that. That's called eisegesis. Exegesis is more important right now than ever before. Remember what those two terms mean. Eisegesis means I'm going to give you my opinion. This is what I think. This is what, this is how I interpret it. No, you don't want eisegesis. I don't care if you love that pastor or not. Run from that church. You don't want you don't want my opinion either. Exegesis is you allow the author of the book, the Holy Spirit, to reveal what it is that he wants you to know. That's why I'm giving you all these scriptures so that you can read them. I am what according to the scriptures so the Holy Spirit can reveal them to you. That's exegesis. I hope that this is helping somebody. All right, guys, uh, we're going to uh, close in prayer now. <clears throat> yeah, we have some praise reports. We've been praying for Janice, and praise God, she's doing she's doing awesome. She's doing awesome. Little baby Amelia, another one. Praise the Lord. She's home, and she's doing amazing. And they said, thank you for the prayers. <clears throat> and uh, we, I mean, we need to be praying for little Johnny, for, uh, uh, for salvation. And I believe I was told that he was ill as well. Uh, Johnny, uh, you let me know if, if little Johnny's ill or, you know, but we are, but we are keeping him in prayer. Uh Pray for all my nieces and nephews and cousins that do not know the Lord as a personal Savior, that we can lift them up and ask God to minister salvation to them. <clears throat> and we've been praying uh, for, uh, for Dale. I text him today. I have not heard back. I know he was going to be sent home from the hospital. Uh, Brother Dan, I, I don't know whether uh, you've heard from Dale or not, uh, but uh, as of yesterday, the, he was going to be sent home from the hospital. He was in the ER. He's had issues with his, with his high blood pressure and his kidneys. So let's keep Brother Dale in prayer. Uh, and uh, my sister's doing great. She uh, She's staying strong. Uh uh, let's keep Corey in prayer. Uh, he, you know, Corey needs a lot of prayer, guys. Uh, so let's uh, let's just keep him in prayer. Um, and my son-in-law Henry, let's keep him in prayer. He's still waiting for a heart transplant. He, he's waiting patiently. 
Uh, but the older he gets, he gets further behind on the list. So let's keep him in prayer. I'm believing for a miracle myself. And I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys are, are you know, are, are in agreement with me that it would that God can perform and will perform a miracle on Henry, on Henry's heart, and renew his heart anew. So let's go into prayer. Father God, as we lift up this list before you, Lord, we you know every name, you know every ailment, every disease, every every sickness, Lord. And Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we lay this upon the altar. We dare to believe for a miracle, Lord. We say to those, to those that have cancer, Lord, we say to those mountains of cancer, breast cancer, stomach cancer, bone cancer, leukemia, tumors, whatever shape and form those cancers are, we say to those mountains, be cast into the sea in Jesus' name. We say to those mountains, of COVID, of flu, pneumonia, bronchitis, headache, stomach ache, back ache, leg ache, whatever ache, we say to those mountains, be cast into the sea in Jesus' name. We say to those mountains of financial situations, we, we, we say to you, mountain, be cast into the sea in Jesus' name. And Lord, we speak deliverance and healing. And we do not doubt in our heart, but believe we believe in our heart. And we know as we believe, it will come to pass. As Mark eleven twenty three 23 says. And Lord, we know that your word says in Psalms 107, 20, that you sent your word and you healed them. Father, we thank you for sending your word and for healing them. We thank you, Lord, that by your stripes, we have been made whole. We have been healed. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. Lord, lastly, we lift up all the peace of, of Israel, Lord, of Jerusalem, of Canaan. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to minister your shalom peace from the north to the south, east to the west of all Canaan. Not what we see on the map today, but, but what you gave to Israel. All the way to Syria, Lord. All the way to Lebanon. Lord, all those lands, Lord. We pray for your shalom peace. We pray, Lord, that you would minister salvation to the inhabitants of Canaan, Jew and Gentile. We pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of their hearts that they can see the mighty armies of the Lord surrounding that nation. In Jesus' name. We lift up Afghanistan, this Islamic Muslim nation, Lord. This nation, Lord, of hate and murder. Lord, we pray, Father God, that you would take their hearts of stone. Their hearts of hate and anger, Lord. And turn into hearts of flesh. Tender and soft, Lord. And that the Holy Spirit can minister salvation to them. As so many have already come to you, but in, Lord, in faith. In faith. And Father, minister salvation, minister your shalom peace to, Lord, to the inhabitants of Afghanistan. We lift up the Ukraine. Father God, that they will learn to put their faith and trust in you, not their faith and trust in America, but their faith and trust in you. Open the eyes of their hearts, Lord, that they can see the hand of God moving in their nation. Take their hearts of stone, turn it into hearts of flesh, make it pliable to the moving of the Holy Spirit. From, from, from the local mayor of that, of, those, of that nation all the way to the president or the leader of that nation, Lord. In Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up all of our law enforcement and military personnel. Continue to put a hedge around them. Hedge of protection around them. Cover them with your precious blood. Lord, let them raise that banner, serve and protect high, high and above all things, Lord. Being mindful of what their mission is. Lord, that they're there to serve and protect, not to be abusive, not to, not to be controlling, but to be serving and 
protecting. Give them discernment and wisdom, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you and praise you. We lift up America, the mightiest and greatest nation in the world. And only because it was created, invented and created under Judeo-Christian principles. And as a result, Lord, this nation has been blessed above all nations. And we have been able to be a blessing to all nations and be a protector of all nations. Lord, I pray that you would minister to our leaders. Take their hearts of stone, turns up their hearts of flesh, Lord. Lord God, that they would have discernment and wisdom in operation. And that they would stop with this wokeness and take us back to what made this country the greatest nation, Judeo-Christian principles. And Lord, we come against the spirit of abortion, a murder, Lord, that is running rampant in our nation today. And I pray, Father God, that, that this mountain of, of the spirit of abortion, Lord, that, that it would be cast in, into the pit of hell where it belongs. And the eyes of those that are trying to pass this demonic law, Lord, that their eyes would be open to see the heinous crime that they are committing by murdering these babies. Lord, move upon our nation, Lord. Move upon those that are trying to make abortion a right in every country, in every, in, in every nation, in every state of our nation as well. Lord, move upon our country. Lord, I pray that Christians would arise, would arise and begin to see their enemies scattered. And Lord, that the church would, would stop with this, with this wokeness and this being meek and mild, Lord, and, and, and this spirit of compromising, but that they would tear down the walls and open the doors to you and let you come in. So one church can become powerful in the name of Jesus we thank you and we praise you Lord I pray for all those that are watching today that you bless them in the coming in bless them in the going out bless their homes bless their finances bless their children bless their grandchildren bless their health in Jesus name Father we thank you and praise you and, Lord, continue to, to minister to my brother Dan, Lord. We lift him up. We lift up my brother, Lord. Lift him up to greater heights. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to close with this one song that I started with when I started the service. It took a miracle. And it took a miracle. My father is omnipotent, and that you can't deny a God of might and miracles, tears written in the sky. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Well, praise the Lord, guys. God bless you all. I love you all. I will see you Sunday at 11.30. Those of you that missed Sunday service, I encourage you to go back and hear it again. I know I am going to hear it again. God bless you guys. I'll see you Sunday.